I'm on. Oh yeah. 700 miles to come do it. Stud in the box. 655.9. You're listening to the Point Click Fish Podcast. We bring you the best in fishing entertainment with interviews, how-tos, stories, food, fishing reports from the captains, teens, and celebrities that are all in the industry. And now, here's your host, Captain Jay Feimster and the Point Click Fish team. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Point Click Fish Podcast. Price, we've got a great show planned today. Kicking things off again. Uh, Price, how are things going? Yeah, things are going, man. Just taking it easy. Uh, we're, you know, uh, wishing everybody well. And, uh, sounds like hopefully we'll get back to normal here sooner rather than later. And I hope everybody's doing well. And I uh, hope you enjoy the podcast today. Yeah, I tell you, we're we're excited. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of our listeners ask for species specific podcast, and that's something that we put together with a lot of the great captains and charters that that we work with um, to be able to share their knowledge and what they do. Um, you know, with their individual fisheries, and that's something that's really exciting for us is to kind of talk in detail um, about. Uh, species specific and today we're going to talk to Captain uh, Jesse McDowell from Florida Inshore Extreme Charters as you know Price we work a lot with Captain Jesse and Captain Kelly um, you know we we do a lot of web, web work of the guys and they do amazing work um, they're constantly on the water and they're fishing but today we're going to talk about Goliath Grouper Fishing 101 that's something that these guys do a lot uh, in fact uh, we were talking earlier before the show aired Price, as you know, um, talking, uh, my wife, Andrea, actually wants to go catch a Goliath grouper. That's a fish that's on a, a bucket list for a lot of people. But today, I wanted to, talk, to welcome Jesse to the show. Captain Jesse McDowell, welcome, buddy. Hey, buddy. How you guys doing? We are doing fantastic. And like I said, we were all talking before the show and, and catching up and seeing how everybody was doing. And I tell you, you guys have an amazing fishery and an awesome operation down there in Florida. Tell us a little bit about you, the business, the location, the fishery. Sure. Well, I'm um, born here in Florida and I grew up in, uh, you know, fishing out of uh, Gainesville and we lived out in a small town. Still only got one red light to this day. Uh, where, where my hometown is, but uh, my folks still live there. But I've uh, joined the Army in uh, 1990, and I was in the Army for 22 years. And then when I retired, I retired in 2011, and then started up my my charter business here. It was kind of a, you know, I didn't know what else to do. And I was like, what else do I know how to do other than drive boats and go fishing? Well, I combined the two, and I'm like, well, there's charter captain for you. So you now put the, uh, you know, put the old little how-to together and. And I uh, got that rolling and started uh, prowling around with Kelly, and she's a phenomenal fisherman. She'll outfish just about anybody that I know. <laughs> so um, we got a little dynamic duo thing going on here, and then we, we started uh, rolling the ball and getting it work thrown up a little bit. We've been doing it for, what is that, since 2011. And um, so that's pretty much it. You know, we got, we got a pretty good reputation around here. Folks know us. You know, we don't. We don't harass anybody too awful bad, and we um, a lot of the guides around here know us and kind of respect us the way they, the way we we handle our business. So we try to be as professional as we can be, and that's due to my military background. Um, so you know, you no, know, we don't we don't cause too much trouble. We kick our heads down and keep rolling. That's it, what we do. It's really cool that you get the opportunity to to work with your wife. That's something that's really awesome. Is you know, you guys get uh, like you said, got the the dynamic duo down there. Um, doing great things, and that that's something that's really a, a unique opportunity for you to be able to get to do every day. Yeah, we she and I spend you know almost every waking moment. Most of our our friends would be like, "Man, I'd kill my wife if I had to work with her." <laughs> um, but you know, you get two people that have you know common ground to stand on. I mean, especially with fishing. I mean, you know, you're not not every day you get to go home with your best buddy every day and you know, sleep in the same bed with them. And, not that you would, but, you know, that's what, you know, our, our relationship is like that. You know, sometimes we do butt heads a little bit on the boat with, you know, who's the captain today, because she's a captain as well, and she runs her own home business sometimes. Um, but, you know, we, we do pretty good. We, you know, we know each other. We know how each other works. You know, we can usually do stuff without talking, you know, just how you, you know, you like when your wife looks at you funny, you know what's up, and then when you look at her funny, she knows what's up, too. Um, but she's one of those people that's just a, she's a rare rare creature as far as her ability to fish, knowing, you know, exactly what, what I know 
um, you know, and us working together. I mean, we just competing the pot, if you will. So, Jesse, you you had mentioned obviously you're you're a military veteran, and, and as you know, I, I'm a military veteran as well. What's something from your military background and career that you find has carried over into your charter fishing? Well, what I did in the military was that I was a watercraft operator, so I drove boats for the Army. Not a lot of people know that we had boats in the Army. I mean, at one point, um, you know, kind of during the middle of my career, we actually had more boats than Navy did. So I definitely definitely had more boats than the Coast Guard as well. Um, but they did a lot of rearranging, and, you know, we had a lot of... When I first started driving, it was, uh, I worked on uh, hovercraft. So I started on the hovercraft as a crew chief. You know, I, I got to Fort Story, Virginia, in about 1992 after I finished all my training and stuff and started working on the hovercrafts and then eventually moved over to what they call the Lark, which is a heavy amphibian. It was a wheeled tire, a wheeled vehicle that, you know, went from land in, in the water. I did that for a while and then I was an instructor for a while and also taught, you know, rules of the road, you know, driving the boat, boat handling, you know, not, not that kind of good stuff like that. So, you know, I had a pretty versatile uh, career. Um, spent some time in the desert, two tours to the, uh, the Persian Gulf, one for one, it was like eight months, and the other one for a year. So two of those over there in the Kuwait Naval Base area. So I got to see a lot of that as well. So a lot of, you know, my experience, um, and that's kind of where we, you know, Kelly and I both, you know, I've got the experience and the background and, you know, of handling boats in really poor conditions and you know, a lot of people are looking up in the tower when I'm driving the boats when I go out super fishing, for example, and I've got the boat, you know, an inch away from the concrete pylon hovering, you know, and so that that's where my expertise comes into play with it. You know, Kelly's just she's just an all around player, super smart, super intelligent. You know, it's not that a lot of times you have people that are smart and intelligent and she's definitely both of them. So she runs a very good business and I, I run a pretty good boat, so well, that's awesome. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that uh, you know people's military careers that carry over into what they do. So it's I always like to ask that question because um, you know a lot of times um, a lot of people are just un- unaware of people's uh, backgrounds, and that's something that uh, plays a big part when you're on the water. Um, you know whether it's uh, good weather or bad weather, uh, and a lot sure, of times. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, they, go ahead. No, I was going to say I would think that you know most folks that are. You know, when you think of a captain, you think of somebody that's, you know, old, pressy, you know, salt that's been around for a while, but there's not a lot, you know, there's not a lot of those guys. And a lot of guys are, you know, kind of new, you know, they they don't, nowadays it seems like they'll give anybody a captain's license. They sometimes kind of do a little background check and find out exactly what, you know, people have to offer, not just that that they're a captain, but it's, you know, what they've done in the past or, you know, what kind of experience they've had, you know, and granted, I haven't been a charter captain. You know, for that many years, but I was always a good fisherman, and Kelly's the same way. Kelly's a phenomenal fisherman as well. So, you know, some people that are, you can tell, like, people have it. You know, people that have it, they have it. You know, it's not like something you can teach that or, you know, something that's a learned trait. Like, when, when you fish with somebody, you're like, man, that guy's a good fisherman or that girl's a good fisherman or whatever it is. You know, like, they have it, whatever it is. So, you get two people on a boat that have that, and that's pretty good, pretty good success. Yeah, I always tell people, you can always tell how good a captain is, is uh, when when it gets really dark, when the weather gets really bad, or the current's really fast, you can, you, it, 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 it tells its tale real quick. It sure does. But we want to talk about Goliath Grouper. Goliath, Gru- Goliath Grouper Fishing 101. Obviously, that's something that you do a lot of in your area, and you target those species a lot. Tell us a little bit about goliath grouper fishing uh, in general kind of just summarize it in the beginning um about the fishery that you have there for goliath grouper well for eight years back in the early 90s i think it was they actually decided to put these things on the on the, the uh, endangered species list to make them non-harvestable and that's one of those things like you know i remember growing up as a kid um like with the gag grouper for instance you know we used to go out uh, diving and you know, spearfish these, but I don't ever remember having a limit on those gags, and now they do. So, I mean, I think that's a really good thing that they've done, is they put, you know, people, because there's so many people in the water now that have so much access, and electronics are so much better. I mean, it's not like in the old days where you had the Lorraine Sea, where you would put you somewhat close to an wreck out there, and you had to find it. You know, so many days out there, my dad spent, you know, 30 minutes doing circles out there trying to find that little barge that we were trying to anchor on. So, you know, 
And then that, that aspect of it, um, a lot of people think that the Goliath Ripper are nuisance fish, which, you know, I can't, I understand that, but it was me as a charter captain that uses it for our business. I mean, it's, there's, it, here's the thing, right? When the people drop down their, their little, you know, whatever they're, you know, they've, they've had stored in the garage for 10 years and they've got, you know, 15, 20 pound test on them trying to catch a snapper, you know, fish are opp- opportunists. Just like a snook, just like a redfish, trout, any other kingfish, you know, they're they're there, you know, they're eating to live. And the Goliath is the same way, just like the sharks and anything else. You know, they're opportunistic, and they're there to take out and weed out the you know the, the lesser or the weaker fish, if you will. So when you hook onto that snapper or that little bit of a grouper, now it could be a big grouper too. I've seen things come up in the tank, you know, large fish like amberjack, you know, and, and hit them at the surface. So that, that fish is in distress, and they're going to take it out because it's an easy meal for them. So that's what they're doing. You know? But I've also, I'm a diver as well. I um, got dirt, certified diver when I was uh, 11. So I've got a lot of experience underwater as well. So I've seen these. I've seen a snapper swim right in front of their faces. I've seen groupers swimming right next to them. I've seen all these little fish swimming right next to them. They don't even bat an eyelash out. Um, but yeah, you put a hook in them and put them in distress, and they're on it quick. You know, so... Had them too, where I where I've shot snapper and grouper, and I've had to glass pounce on them real quick because now they've got a spear shot through them. So you know that you gotta have to kind of watch that as well. Um, but our uh, our fishery here is is phenomenal. We did take a little bit of a hit when that red tide. You know, we had the hurricane, and then right behind that, we had the big red tide that came up. Now the red mm-hmm. tide, we get that every year, and it, and it happens. Just, and it's just how bad it's going to happen from year to year that we, we get it. But we did lose quite a bit of our fish. I mean, we're talking a fish that can live up to 50 years, and, and when you lose 40 of them um, just in our little area right here in Boca Grande Pass, um, we lost quite a few. And that, we felt that. You know, we felt those, those fish, their presence when they left. We felt that. So. Yeah. Now, one of the things with, with your fishery, like if some, like if you go out to scout a location, or I mean, generally, let, let's assume somebody knows nothing about glide grouper. I mean, is it generally structure? You know, are, are they deep? Are they shallow? What What's something that you look for? You know, when scouting a location. Well, for the most part, the glide grouper they can live on the hard bottoms. They can live in the ledges. They seem to kind of tend, have a tendency towards the structure. Anywhere that's going to, you know, accumulate a large amount of fish, like, for instance, there's, you know, you have a barge out there or, or a favorite, you know, rock pile or a culvert, you know, reef or something like that. They're going to be there because, you know, everything else there is the food chain. You know, you got the big fish that are there, you got the little bit bigger fish that are there, and obviously you're going to have the apex predator like sharks and glass grouper. So they're, they're, um, they're going to be around wherever there's going to be, you know, large food sources, and in particular, like the pass, you know, Book Grand Pass. The reason why those fish are there is because you've got an enormous amount of water that feeds from Charlotte Harbor, Pine Island, you know, Gaspillo Sound, all those areas there that feed that one little, you know, quarter mile wide or however, you know, big it is, little stretch of water that squirts that stuff out like a garden hose. And you can see just like recently, we've been out, we've been having pretty good shrimp around here lately. So we've been out, you know, shrimping at night. And I can hear these Goliath Rupert fucking crabs in the surface behind me at night. You know, and it sounds like somebody's throwing a Volkswagen in the water. <laughs> It'll definitely get your attention when that happens. Um, so that's cool. So I, I tell you what, that right there, I mean, you think about like a bass or a snook or you know, something else like that, just crushing a topwater bait and amplify that by about a thousand times. And that's what that Goliath Cooper sounds like when it crushes the crab on the surface. Because that's mostly, and I think that's a little bit of the, you know, the bigger problem, not a problem, but the mis- misconception is that everybody thinks, oh, these Goliath Cooper are down there eating all the snapper and all the, the groupers that are down there that we're trying to catch. No, that's not necessarily true. Probably 95% of the Goliath that we catch, you know, any, any fish is going to do this. You know, they're, they're in distress. They're trying to, you know, recurtitate whatever's, you know, they're trying to get whatever's in their mouth out. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when they come up, you know, they're regurgitating crabs. So that's most of their diet is, is crab, you know, and kind of whatever else they can get. Every day. Oh, actually, here's a pretty good story. Uh, about a month ago, we were, we were, uh, it had a Goliath grouper, we put client on the boat, it was, well, maybe two months now, but before we had all this craziness going on, um, get him up to the surface, and I thought that he had, um, chucked up like a, a spade fish or, you know, a permit or something like that. It was kind of big. You know what it ended up being? It was a sea turtle. Wow. 
yeah, it was a big old sea. It was a sea turtle that was probably about 18 inches wide and 18 inches around. And it, Goliath Cooper just sucked it right in and, and ate it. Nice little snack for it, yeah. I couldn't believe it. You know, we were like, we took some pictures of it. You know, the pictures obviously they didn't turn out all that great because the current's got it now and it's pulling it away from us so it didn't look as big as when it first chucked it up. But I couldn't, I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff. Stingrays, you know, whatever fish, crab, you know, yada, yada, mullet, you know, whatever they can get. <laughs> Even I had, we had caught one one time that had a lobster sticking out of it. You could see the antenna sticking out of it out of his mouth when we caught it so it was you know they eat just about anything but i think the majority part 90 95 percent is crap so let's talk about a little bit about the tackle needed like your you know your preferred setup you know rod reel line leader you know what if, if you're catching a massive fish of this size obviously if you don't have the right equipment the right tackle it's not going to work out well for you which i'm sure you see a lot of um, you know, other people out fishing trying to catch these. But if somebody was looking for like the ideal setup, what would uh, Captain Jesse McDowell say? Well, I like the first off, the I you know I do some different stuff to my tackle, obviously, that you know you're not going to get. Um, you get a lot of the bigger rods that you need um, have roller guides on. And I've kind of found over the years that the roller guides don't do so well when you're putting that much pressure on a, on a you know, the, the rod and the reel. Because the drag, yeah, the drag, you know, gets you a little bit. But then the eyes also, and I never really realized this too much, but the eyes actually give you a little bit of drag as well. So, you know, when you're cranking down, you know, 20, 35 pounds of drag, you're actually putting a little bit more pressure on that fish. And we've broken just about everything that we've ever bought. So don't ever think that there's one magic rod that's going to do it. You know, you I, I go through some fear like you would not believe as far as, you know, because these, we're asking these this stuff to you know do stuff that it's not really designed to do. The best rod that I've come across is a, is just the old good old ugly stick, you know, the biggest one that you can find. Mm -hmm. um, and and things that go along with it, for example, like you know the obviously busting off the eyes um, for one, and real sheep spinning, uh, the the uh, gimbal butts, you know, actually breaking off because it's not a it's not a metal butt, you know, you've got a fiberglass, you know blank that goes all the way through. Um, we've broken, as a matter of fact, I've got a Penn International 70 that's sitting in my garage right now that I've got, a, you know, gears on the way that I've got to replace, you know, so many fish and you've got to strip gears now. Um, but that's usually what I use, you know, the, the ugly stick rod, and you know, I'm using an um, uh, international uh, two-speed, and obviously we're putting that in, in low range when we're doing that in, in first year. Um, because that's kind of what I tell people a lot of times too, is, you know, like let the gear, you know, cause physically, you know, you're talking anywhere from, you know, a hundred to, you know, potentially 500 pound fish. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not, I, I can't pick up 500 pounds by myself. And that's yeah. what you're asking us to do. You know, so, and, and it so, won't, and um, it won't quit. It keeps going. <laughs> that's right. You know, you've got something that you're doing for fun, like this person something that's fighting for its life. It doesn't know what's going on. You know, it's thinking something's trying to get it. So, um, uh, the biggest hook that you could possibly get, you know, we're using 20 yacht circle hooks. We have to use circle hooks uh, when we're, we're going after these fish. And what we do different than I think a lot of people that are doing as far as guides go, we also take uh, DNA samples for the FWC. Uh, Kelly's got a, a, she used to work for the FWC and she knows those folks. And they asked us to, you know, start sampling fish for them. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out if these are all the same family type you know, groups or, you know, if there's new fish that are coming in or what, you know, what they're trying to track them is basically what they're doing. So, sure. You know, we're not only just catching these fish for fun, we're also doing a little bit of science behind it. So we can actually possess these fish for a uh, short, you know, get what we need, we measure them, you know, uh, take a little thin clip and then we get them back in, you know, on their way as, you know, safely as, as humanly possible. So that's kind of the thing that we do as well. Now, um, what, ab what, line, what about, what about line? Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I was, our line we're using, you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 pound test. So, you know, I always tell folks when we go into this, you know, when I go into battle, I'm not taking my M16. I'm taking my M1A1A1. You know, so mm -hmm. we go in, we're not going in with a, with a small gun. We're taking the big gun. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, are fight, you are fighting a Volkswagen. <laughs> That's right. You know, we always describe that, you know, and, and, it's, and it's ridiculous because you don't, it, it, folks don't expect the amount of power that these fish actually possess. I mean, it's unreal. I mean, you're not think you're thinking a fish. You know, oh, I got a fish. I got a fish. And I've caught marlin. I've caught tuna. You know, I lived in Hawaii for three years when I was in the military. We caught all kinds of stuff that was out there. You know, spearfish, tailfish, and you name it. I, I pretty much caught a lot of these 
these bigger fish. And you've got what, you know, the drag is most of the time what folks are, you know, used to getting. But when we do it, we don't have any drag. We've got this thing locked down in the, the, you know, just as hard as it, you know, we'll take the tension lever and we'll crank it all the way down until we can still get it all the way up into the full lock, you know, and then when we're fishing, that's where it stays. It stays in the full lock. So when it hits, <laughs> You know, you've got a lot of a lot of things that can potentially go wrong. And I've had, you know, a lot of things go wrong. We've had rods break with an eyes broke breaking off of it, had a, a tip wrapped around inside the trolling motor because you know and you know, different different fish have different ways they act. You know, some are not so hard and some are just like, Man, that thing fought like crazy. Especially when you get up alongside the boat. You know, that's that's kinda of one of the Places it's dangerous. That's where my you know expertise comes in play, and I know how to handle the fish, and I don't put my hands in his mouth, things like that. You know, I got a special little rig that I make on there that I have a loop, you know, so I can kind of just hold on to it. And, and then that's the um, that's pretty much that's the way we do that. So, what would you say? You you talked about some of the misconceptions on, on targeting, um, you know, Goliath grouper. What, what what would you say some of the other misconceptions are about either targeting the species or while fishing for them? Um, anything else that comes to mind? As far as what was it? Just Did misconceptions about the, the the fish in general, whether um, you know people underestimate the size or or you know targeting oh, the sure. fish. I mean, yeah. Definitely. That's what I was saying about their, their power. I mean, I like to describe them as like sumo wrestlers. You know, sumo wrestler, he's got a lot of power, but he doesn't have a whole lot of endurance. And that's kind of what you get with these fish. You know, you know, you think about catching a, uh, you know, a gag reaper, if you're out bottom fishing, you know, the first thing you got to do is you got to get them up off the bottom and get them out away from that structure. And the, the further you get them up, you know, the, the tired, the more tired they become and, you know, the, the better your chances are. So the first, 10 seconds of the battle is probably the most crucial. I mean, they make that first initial run. He's got all this power. He's got everything is topped off at 100%. You know, and he, every run that he makes, you know, he drops 10% or 20% or however, you know, wherever that fish is endurance I was. He's been swimming around a lot. He's nice and powerful. He's going to let you know that he's got four or five good big runs in him that, you know, potentially can hurt you. I've, I've had to, you know, I say we've adapted our, our style a little bit as far as, um, you know, the way we change things to make it a little bit more safer for our customers. Because I had the rod, the fish ran away from the structure at one time. You know, we were kind of offshore a little bit in like 45 feet of water or so. And the fish ran away from the boat. So you can imagine us having it. And deer, here, by the way, makes a phenomenal seat. You know, I mean, our buddy um, Mark makes his, these chairs down here. He came down as a tarpon fisherman, but they work really great for the Goliath grouper um, as well. So I have that thing that's bolted to the deck, you know, and then the, the rod is, you know, attached to the chair. But what happened is the fish ran away from the boat, and, you know, as he's pulling away from the boat, when he pulls straight down, it kind of locks the rod into the boat. It hits the side of the gunnel, you know, the rod is stuck in the gimbal, you know, everything's kind of pinched, and it's not going anywhere. You, to, at that point, you can kind of let go of it. And that was kind of the roller coaster ride thing that I was telling you about earlier. Um, once it's locked in there, it's not going anywhere. You have the rod tip spinning, and that's why the glass rod is important. Um, so anyway, this fish is running away from the boat, and no sooner than I had said, you know, and it was the woman had, you know, the, the rod in her hands, and she was fighting the fish, and I said, make sure that, you know, when it runs away from you, your only job is to make sure you keep that rod in the gimbal locked in nice and tight. And no sooner that I said that, it slipped out, hit the side of the boat, the rod butt came up, hit her in the cheek, and cut her cheek like, you know, probably a two-inch gash on her cheek or something when the metal rod butt hit her. You know, and I thought, when I heard it, you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, we broke her jaw. You know, so mm -hmm. luckily she just got cut and got, you know, like she got kicked in the face. Um, and her, her boyfriend jumped in, and we ended up fighting the fish and getting into the boat. And it was a big fish, too. You know, it was probably 450, 550, somewhere along there. You know, when those fish get that big, it's kind of hard to, you know, like, get a good estimate of, you know, how big, you know, 50 pounds. When a fish like that isn't that much of a of a sway, so that's why I was saying, you know, not only you know catching those fish um, is hard enough, you just got to make sure that no one's getting hurt doing it too. Because there, you, know, you think about roping a steer, or you know, someone like who's ever done that in the past. Yeah, and that those little jokers are strong. You know, I mean, they'll knock you off your feet when they're a five hundred pound animal. So. Yeah, you know, you know, like you said, it's something where safety is a big concern. I mean, obviously. A fish with that much power and that much stamina, 
it's going to last a while, you know, which kind of leads me into the next question about the, you know, the physical and mental aspects of fighting a, a fish like this, because you could hook up with a hundred pound fish or a 500 pound fish. You, you don't know. So what would you say uh, you don't know. the physical or mental aspects of, uh, you know, Goliath grouper fishing? Well, the, obviously the, the physical portion of it is, is that one, you're either strong enough to do it, because we've had some folks that are like that, you know, we had a guy that looked was, was like a linebacker, he was like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, probably about 250 pounds, and he was a big boy, you know, he was able to stand up and go toe-to-toe with that 250 or 300 pound fish, just to, you know, actually I was I was fighting him just as hard as he was fighting the fish to keep him in the chair, because that's kind of what my rules is, you, you stay in the seat, you know, you don't try to get up, um, so, you know, we're, we're not only watching what the fish is doing, but I'm watching them as well, but, um, so yeah, that uh, yeah, the mental aspect of it. And most of the time, what happens is we have folks that are on the boat. And, you know, they, they're up having a good time, and you know, the first person that they're a little bit timid. I usually have them go first because when they when they see if they don't go first, when they see that first person that's going, and they see what happens, they're usually like, "No, nah, you know what? I think I'll pass on this one." So if they're a little bit timid on it, I usually have them go first. And then they kind of see that, you know, the way, the way that we do it is relatively safe. And it's not really, you know, it's not, it's not ever 100% safe. I've had people say, oh, I want to put a belt on the seat. Well, that's not a great idea. If you're going to put a belt, tie you to the chair now, you've got a big, you know, honking fish on the other end that's ripped that seat off the deck. And now you're in the water with a fish and a chair strapped to you. No, that's not a good idea. So, yeah, you're, let's, um, let's think this through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, but the physical aspect of it, and like we were talking earlier on, you know, we had a family of four on the boat one day, and they caught 12 goliaths on, on one trip, and they actually had their 13-year-old daughter. Um, I think we have that on our, our uh, YouTube page as well. So, I mean, if you look at our YouTube page, I actually, I actually can see them, you know, fighting the fish, you know, you know, and Kelly catches these fish all the time. Too. I mean, there's techniques as far as, you know, how, how to catch these fish. So, you know, if you're not physically strong enough, to go, to, if you think you're not just too strong enough to go toe to toe with one of these big monsters, you know, that's where the technique. And if you listen, you know, like I tell folks all the time, like, look, listen, this is what, this is how you fight this fish, you know, and, and watch. And, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, you kind of, you get, you get stuck in it, kicked in the head by a mule, and then you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're stuck. <laughs> you're, you're stunned, if you will, you know. And so that's what we kind of do is, you know, like, calm down and listen to what I'm trying to tell you, and this is how you do it. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. Obviously, is the people that come and and they charter a big piece of the success is to listen to the captain and those tips and those tricks to help them get through it. Because they, if they've not done that before, they would know those tips or tricks, and they have to be able to follow those directions while the fish, you know, while they're fighting the fish to be successful as well. Yeah, and that's why you hire us, because we have the technical expertise and the know-how, and we've done it before. You know, if I go to a doctor, I'm not going to tell him, you know, how to operate on my gallbladder. I'm going to let him do it, you know? Yeah, and, and, and a lot of times that saves a lot of pain and heartache for people to uh, <laughs> to have somebody else that knows that knows what they're doing. Because, again, if you hook up with a five, you know, 500-pound fish, that's you're, you're going to go for a ride for a while. Yeah, yeah you sure are. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, there's only, there's only one thing that's got to go wrong for you not to catch it. Everything's got to go right for you to be able to catch it. And one thing that goes bad, you know, came over. Yeah, you know, one thing uh, I would say that has made Goliath Grouper uh, more appealing to a lot of people are a lot of the YouTube videos of people doing, you know, fishing with it and, and you know, the fight and the thrill of, of catching these fish because you'll see, you know, a lot of that on YouTube. But one of the things that you see, and we discussed this um, as well, about you, you, you know, you go through the fight, you you hook the fish up, you fight the fish, you know, it it runs. Just just for our listeners' sake, generally start to finish. What what's the time frame? Uh, I mean, I know it can vary, but generally speaking, what's the time frame that uh, someone ends up fighting that fish for? Well, I I tell people that you know it's it's like this, you know. If you take your, like we used to do the fireman's carry, Jay, and I'm sure you've kind of done some of that stuff, and mm-hmm. you're moving people out of a compartment or something like that when, you're, when you've got a fire or whatever, casualties and things like that. So imagine, you know, throwing your buddy on your shoulder and then having to do a 100-yard dash. That's kind of what it's like as far as, you know, if, you don't, if you're not listening to what the technique is. 
Um, but normally, um, it can last anywhere from, and this is going to surprise you, at three to five minutes. But it feels like um, three hours. It sure does. <laughs> and yet that 100-yard stretch with your buddy on, his, on your back sure seems a lot further than just 100 yards. And that's kind of what I'll have to tell people, too. Is it's like, you know, look, you got to, you know, listen to what we're telling you as far as the techniques. And, you know, these, these are things that are going to, it's a difference between catching your fish and getting some great pictures with it and having a memory. You know, because I always say that, that we're in the business of selling memories. I mean, anybody can take these fishing, um, but, you know, that's what we do. We try to make it memorable for you. And get you up to the, like when we do catch a good fish, we call it a beach fish. And if we're, you know, around the phosphate docks or somewhere we can get over closer to the beach, we try to ease over to the beach. Now, remember, I'm holding this fish in my hand as we're easing over to the beach. You know, it's not like we're just tying off their cleats and, you know, and then making a run for it. You know, we try to get over there in general because, remember, we're also, these fish are our livelihood, you know, I mean, I'm trying to get, you know, to catch these fish again tomorrow, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to mess it up, you know, I want to make sure this fish is healthy and, you know, gets back into its environment and recuperate and eat and, and, and be healthy and, you know, catch them again another day. And so, that's, you know, that's it, you know, five minutes or so. So, so basically you've got three to five minutes to get it right or screw it up. <laughs> Well, usually when you screw it up, it's not a five-minute thing. Usually when you screw it up or it gets messed up, it's usually within the first 30 seconds. You know, that's usually the, the, the crucial hump um, is, is, you know, pretty quick. You know, uh, the other day we had a, a, a buddy of ours that was down the street from us, and, you know, obviously we're not working, but that was one of his dreams, too, was being, he brought some folks down with us, and we had gone and caught Goliath with them. He's like, you know what, man? He's like, I never caught one before. I'm like, well, come on, let's go catch one. And, uh, I think he caught a small one at first, and we dropped another bait down, and then it happened. He got spooled, and when it, you know, it got to the end of that, you know, <laughs> the line that's on the reel, and have you ever been spooled by a big fish? Yes. Yeah. So when it gets to the end of the line, what happens? You know, you get that little pop. You know, break your line, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, this one, when that 600 pound gets to the end of it, it sounds like a, a 22 shot going off. And usually, when that line comes off and goes through the eyes, that's usually where we break stuff. Like, we pulled off three of our eyes um, as that line was exiting the, the, the rod tips. So, that's usually where we break stuff. And then you said, man, I wonder how big that fish was. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, it's not often that we get our butts handed to us like that, you know, like where we get schooled and just get owned, you know. It's like, you know, like well, that was a good one, so... That's good stuff. But I've also been in the water there too, and fortunately enough, the hooks that we use, you know, they rust out real quickly. We do catch them all the time. The things that I think we had talked about earlier on, and I don't know if this is kind of jumping the gun, but your question was, you know, like inferior gear that people use. Are you ready for that one yet? Or are we gonna? Yeah, no, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So we catch these fish a lot of times. You know, I think one year we kept count. That was a couple of years ago before the red tide. One year we caught 264 goliaths. And that was, you know, documented. We took DNA samples. We kept, you know, a really good count of how many fish we caught that year. Um, and that's, that's quite a lot of fish. You know, 264 in, in, a, in a season. Um, but like a lot of times we're catching them, we would get to a point where we would recognize fish. You know, if we had one that had a big white patch on one side, like from this midway down into his tail, it had like a lighter patch. It was kind of like a birth defect or something. And most of these times, these things are kind of a, you know, they can be a darker, kind of a chocolate color, molten pattern, and up to like kind of a yellow. And this one had a big old yellow patch on the side. So we started to recognize that fish. Or you get a fish that has a messed up lip for when he was little, and, you know, something ripped it, and he just kind of, you know, had the top lip kind of stuck in, and his bottom lip, with most fish are like that anyway, but it was a lot more pronounced. You could kind of see it. Um, we've also gotten fish that we've had. I've had to reach in as quickly and as gently as I possibly could to get this hook out. It's got, you know, 10 foot of, of cable. Now, those things like that, you know, as far as, you know, hooks are hooks. And, you know, when they take a fish, inadvertently they do it, but they, they seem to do okay. Um, but when they've got one in their mouth with, you know, six feet of cable sticking out of it, I don't necessarily think that's something that should be good because those fish can get caught. Um, you know, on things down there and, and, you know, there's jagged things that stick out, you know, pieces of metal and bolts and whatnot, you know, and imagine, you know, that fish getting that cable wrapped around something and now he's hooked onto a pylon. He can't eat, you know, he can't do anything and he's just going to sit there and starve to death. And, you know, so that would kind of be the thing that I would like to see folks do, you know, if they're not going to 
use, um, you know, heavy monofilament or something like that, you know, or something that's going to cut and kind of get, get away from them quickly. But that stainless steel uh, seven strand, you know, braided wire is no good. I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, them not, it's not a bite leader that you're trying to make there. You know, you, if you're going to do it, you need to have the whole reel full of that stuff because usually what happens, like a reef fish, you know, if they get into the structure, they're going to cut you off from the structure. You know, if he's pulling, you're pulling, and then you're going to cut it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you've got like five feet of, of braided stainless steel cable, that's not really doing the fish any justice. You know, you're just going to lose it and it's going to be down there, you know, hanging out of his mouth. And I've, I've caught those fish before, you know, so they're eating. They're eating again, but I'm just saying, I'm sure that the possibility exists. And I've been in the water filming TV shows, you know, Bill Blodgett, Mark Davis, and you know, all those guys that are, you know, doing that stuff that you see on TV a lot of times. That's usually, you know, that when they're down here, they're usually filming with us. There's a lot of them that film. I'm not saying that we're the only ones, but, you know, we do a lot of that stuff. But I've been in the water with their cameras, equipment, and stuff, and filming these fish, and you can see them with lines hanging out of their mouth and everything like that. But, um, Hopefully, they, you know, we're not kind of doing the same thing, but I think a lot of times, you know, those hooks that, that we use, you know, they're not super strong. They're not stainless steel hooks, you know, so they, they, they bend relatively easy and they, and they rust out, you know, quicker. So, you know, if we do get popped off, you know, that's why we use them. Yeah, like you said, I mean, this is, you know, the these are fish that we need to take care of and to be able to enjoy not only for your, you know, your livelihood, but also just the fishery in general. And so that's something where people have to take that in consideration to have the right gear, um, you know, to, to be, um, you know, set up for success, but also to be able to have the right gear to protect the fishery as well. Right. Right. With so many people doing, it, you know, now it's hitting YouTube and things like that. You know, there's so many people that, I mean, I'm there all the time, you know, when we're out there fishing, you know, I'm, we're trying to make a living and I try to be as, as fair as I possibly can, but you know, and they got the pontoon boat pulled up there and they've got their little pin center six lot, you know, they're <laughs> sticking over the side of the boat. I'm like, Hey, what's y'all fishing for? And they're like, Oh, we're going for Goliath. And, you know, they've got 50 pound line and, a, you know, a 10 out circle hook, you know, I'm like, we just kind of stick around a little bit. I'm like, well, this is going to be short. You You're know, like, so. this will be 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. So, you know, we just kind of we sit back and wait for them to get out of the way, and then <laughs> that's exactly what happened. So, so one of the things, you know, we always, we, we sell out of um, pictures of people, uh, you know, in the water with fish, like you said, the you know, beach fish, if it's a good fish. So talk to me a little bit about um, this goes into, you know, taking care of the fish. What's something that, you do, uh, you know, the fish, the fishes, um, come up, you, you, you know, bring it to shore, you get a picture with it. What's something that you do to ensure that the fish, um, is released? You know, obviously some people think, Hey, just let it go. And it, it's fine. But, uh, just talk to us a little bit about, well, you know, re reviving that fish. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, like I said, when we take them over to the beach, I'm holding on to the line. So a lot of times I'm getting, Counted on the side of the boat, you know, these fish. Because I don't, you know, I'm not trying to hurt them. And I want to get them over there as safely as possible. So they take a little breather, you know, and they're kind of like a cow sometimes. You know, they'll get over there and they get, you know, they're tired. So they're easy to handle when you get over to the beach. And but you've got to kind of watch as far as when you can. I, I kind of have an idea of when they're getting ready to get stupid. And when I say stupid, like, you know, they're going to start head shaking and trying to get that hook out of their mouth and doing crazy stuff. So I kind of have an idea. I know them enough so I can feel their, you know, their body position and then what they're getting ready to do. I'm like, oh, here we go. We're getting ready to get stupid. Everybody kind of get back. Because even their fins, you know, you're talking about, it's like a Phillips head screwdriver that's like a three or four inch long, you know, screwdriver on them. But I mean, if they get one of those in your neck or something like that, I mean, it can hurt you. I mean, you're like, really not to mention their jaw strength. And their jaw strength is just absolutely immense. You know, and you get your hand stuck in their mouth and they start rolling, you're going to lose something. You know, and that's why I always make sure that, you know, if my customers are holding the fish, I am adamant about do not put your hands in their mouth. You know, I show them how, show them how to hold it, you know, hold on to this loop here that I've got, you know, different things like that. So, but when we're, we're alongside the boat, is we're usually doing two things. One, we're getting a picture. And two, remember I was telling you about getting the DNA, DNA samples for the FWC here. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing two things at once those bigger fish. Now, the smaller fish, if they're, you know, under 200 pounds or so, we'll just do a boat side picture, get the hook out, you know, take our measurements, what we got to do, whatever, and then get them back in the water as quickly as possible. But the bigger fish, you know, the beach fish, is what I like to call them, you know, we get over there nice and gentle with them. We try not to rub them on the sand. We try not to rub them on the boat. You know, we try to keep them out in deeper water so that when we do, you know, we gently support them because those fish, you can't bring them on the boat. 
um, because they can't support their own body weight outside of the water. So anybody that's trying to pull those fish in the boat, take a picture, they're going to kill that fish. That's what we don't want. Mm-hmm. That's what we don't do. So we're in the water with them because it's safer for the fish. Um, not that, you know, it's not always safer for our clients because, like, right now in Boca Grande, we've got all the tarpon run going on. You know, there's tons and tons of tarpon that are in, in the pack. And while, right along with them, there's tons and tons of sharks. We had a fishing trip that we went on just the other day with our, with our friends, and we were doing some fun fishing, just keeping in, keeping in practice. Um, the first tarpon that we caught, destroyed by the sharks it was like a pack of 10 bull sharks just it is, it is unbelievable i mean everything that we try to do to keep the sharks off the fish doesn't doesn't didn't work at all and it's getting worse and that's the bad part about it you can't even hardly when you're fishing anymore you can't even fish you keep catching fish without the sharks just destroying it pouncing on them because we're you know our hummingbird electronics to the side scan i can see the, the tarpon and i can see the, the sharks off the side of them, they're kind of hurting them. You know, they're like a pack of wolves that are just circling those fish, waiting for one of those fish to come out of that pack, and they're going to pounce on it really quick. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the dangers of you know getting in the water with these goliaths too. You know, because we've actually lost uh, a couple years back. We were fighting a goliath out offshore, you know, nothing like we have never done before. And we had a, a about a ten foot bull shark come up and hit the goliath on the way up. I mean, this is a you know three or four hundred pound fish, and it just took it out in like three bites. It was done. You know, we were just all standing there in awe, you know, just like, holy crap, did that just happen? So, I mean, that's another thing we've got to worry about, too. Um, we have some of our, our customers from Japan, for instance, for whatever reason, they like to get in the water with the fish, you know, and make these crazy faces. Like, that's some of the pictures that you guys are probably seeing, you know, they have some of them. look like they're in pain, but I don't know why they do it. But that's just their, I guess, their little gimmick, their little hitch that they like to do. Um, and they always ask, can I get in the water with them? Can I get in the water with them? And I'm so I kind of do an assessment, you know, if we've been having a lot of sharks around or if the shrimp boats are around, no, absolutely not. But, you know, if we, if we haven't seen too many sharks in the water lately, I'm like, look, you've got like 10 seconds, hop in, get a picture and get right back out as quickly as possible. Um, like last year, we had a buddy of ours who, uh, his client was, they were tarpon fishing. He fell off the front of the boat. Uh, when the tarpon made it, what we call a shark run. You know, we know when that, when that fish runs. A certain certain way, like and he's at 110 percent power. You know, he's going, he's getting after it, and like that's a shark one. Um, he actually fell in, the, he fell forward, um, hit the edge of the boat, fell in the water in between the, the shark and the tarpon, and the shark hit him uh, and cut him pretty bad. He ended up getting like a hundred and something stitches. So, oh wow! Those are all things that we, yeah, you know, those are things that we're trying to take into consideration. You know, when we're trying to your, your safety uh, as a client of ours, and we're trying to make sure that everything's still fun, and you know, let let them do the most they want to do but we're keeping them safe at the same time you know so if you're if you guys telling him it's not such a great idea i even want to listen to what the man has to say you know for a woman <laughs> that is true now uh jesse give us your website so they can uh check out um the pictures and also give you a call if they're they want to uh take take your advice and, and book a trip uh you know particularly if they don't know what they're doing um that's something that yeah. uh you know that if you don't know what you're doing, you, you, you may want to learn a little more before you get out there and try it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can definitely get yourself hurt and quick. Like a lot of times folks will want to do these hand line things too, you know, and <laughs> what happens is, you know, people hold the, the line, their, you know, anchor rope, whatever it is they're using, you know, they hold it in their hand and then they get pulled over to the side of the boat and they've got it wrapped on one side, you know, open on the other. And now their hand is in between the rope and the gunnel. Now, remember, this is still a 500-pound, potentially 500, 600-pound fish. Um, it will break every bone in your hand with that rope line being pulled across your hand on the on the gunnel, you know, on the side of the boat. So, you, gotta, you know, seeing people get hurt like that as well. Um, but, yeah, our website www.floridainshoreextreme.com. And it's extreme. I spell it X-T-R-E-A-M because I'm a little, you know, ex-mainstream now. I'm retired. I don't necessarily have to, you know, do the drawing like everybody else does. Um, but you know, we have Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, YouTube videos. If you more than likely, if you if you Google Goliath Cooper and both Grand Cash right now, we're going to pop up. So, yeah, well, Captain Jesse, I tell you, man, I, it is awesome to have you on the show to kind of talk to us about Goliath Grouper Fishing One Hundred and One. Uh, like I said, that's a lot of uh, we get a lot of emails and feedback on wanting information on goliath groupers so we went to the experts and gave yourself and captain kelly a call to uh kind of connect and uh let people know 
what they what they would be getting into uh, if they decided to go glass gruber fishing or um, hiring somebody such as yourself to go out there and uh, get the three to five minutes of uh pure enjoyment i tell you that uh i look forward to coming out and do it yeah. doing it myself yeah you know, i have a first-hand experience well i appreciate you letting me come on the radio and uh you know talking with you guys I and mean, anytime that we can ever talk about fishing you know you know fishing guys love to talk about fishing so, you know, whatever y'all want you can give us a shout Awesome. We appreciate it and look forward to getting back with you here soon. And again, check out the website, FloridaInshoreExtreme.com. Captain Jesse, we appreciate it. Look forward to having you on the show again. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Price is great to have Captain Jesse McDowell, Florida Inshore Extreme, with us to talk grouper fishing or Goliath grouper fishing 101. Yeah. Uh, as Jay said, and Captain Jesse was talking about as well, make sure to go to his website because I'm telling you what, if you want to see some impressive shots of some Goliath groupers and tarpon, I mean, you're going to be amazed to see the size of these fish. I mean, it is something crazy to see. So make sure to check the website out. Yeah, and like we said, look forward to having Captain Jesse on again. Uh, we're going to get together with him to talk about tarpon fishing here in the near future. If that's something you'd like to see or other species that you would like to see here on pointclickfish.com on our fishing podcast, email us at, at uh, pointclickfish.com. The, hit the contact button. Let us know. We'd love to get professionals on the phone, on the radio, to talk to you about species-specific 101 fishing hey who knows price we'll get to 201 and get a little more technical but uh great information today on um goliath grouper fishing and that's something that i look forward to to getting down there to fish with captain jesse and captain kelly uh tell you look forward to doing that a lot oh yeah i think he'll put you on the fish for sure all right guys we'll catch you next time make sure you join us pointclickfish.com the fishing podcast radio